the Lux Radio Theater. Throughout America tonight, this inspired music lifts every heart to new patriotism, as all of us join all of you in pledging full allegiance to our country. We've asked the Columbia Broadcasting System to interrupt our program tonight with any important news developments. We here in the Lux Radio Theater, as well as you who are listening, want to keep in touch with any and all events bearing upon this national emergency. In the meantime, this theater carries on as usual, which, as you know, is one of the oldest and finest traditions of the theater. Tonight, the Lux Radio Theater brings you Melvin Douglas and Virginia Bruce in The Doctor Takes a Wife. A motley parade of characters from all walks of life constantly pass in review on the American screen. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, and every other kind of people that it takes to make a world. But judging from box office records, Perhaps the most romantic of the whole lot, for some reason that I'll leave to you, is the doctor. He seems to exert even more fascination over the American people than the cowboy and the aviator. And perhaps, perhaps Columbia Picture had this in mind when they filmed The Doctor Takes a Wife. It's the story of a doctor who suddenly finds himself married to an author, a beautiful young lady author, who has just made a fortune out of a book telling other young ladies the advantages of not getting married at all. And that's such an embarrassing set of circumstances that it makes a perfect beginning for a comedy. This play will put you in the proper frame of mind to do your Christmas shopping. So you'd better get started on that pretty soon. Because I believe the calendar shows there are just 14 more shopping days left before Christmas. Of course, any one of those 14 days could get off to a very bad start if you suddenly discovered that you were all out of Lux Flakes. You know, there are two kinds of flakes that make a white Christmas. Snowflakes and Lux Flakes. So while you're concentrating on what you're going to give Uncle George and Aunt Susan, put a little Christmas cheer in your housekeeping by giving yourself some Lux Flakes. And now here's The Doctor Takes a Wife, starring Melvin Douglas as Tim and Virginia Bruce as June, with Lynn Carver as Marilyn and Edgar Barrier as John Pierce. The curtain rises for the first act. No, madam, we haven't. I've been doing tickets without spinach. It's just when you give me a copy of spinach. I want two copies of Spinster's on spinach mailed to my aunt. Buy a copy of Spinster's on spinach, my dear, and read every word. You'll never look at Harry again. The author's a bachelor girl, and they say her book answers everything. Is this the book that tells you how to put men in their places? Give me another copy of Spinster's on spinach. The book counter of the John S. Pierce Publishing Company is like Dollar Day in a bargain basement. And all because of one book, Spinster's Aunt Spinach. In the back of the store sits the happy publisher, his desk littered with enthusiastic telegrams. Listen to this, Miss Gray. What H.G. Wells has done for the amoeba, June Cameron has done for the unmarried woman in her book, Spinster's Aunt Spinach. And there are a million wires just like it. Miss Gray, take a telegram. June Cameron, Lakewood Lodge, cut your vacation short and hurry back. Have great plans for a sequel. At Lakewood Lodge, June Cameron hurries across the lobby to the desk. The clerk is not in sight, so she bangs the desk bell impatiently. 
This seems to annoy the gentleman who is using a telephone at the opposite end of the desk. Hey, look, I'm telephoning. Cut it out, will you please? Just go right ahead. Don't mind me. I mean, that thing isn't helping a bit. The connection's bad enough as it is. Yes, I know. Everything's inefficient up here. Come in, Miss Cameron. I'm checking out. I'm in a terrible hurry. I'd like to send a telegram to New York, Hello? please. Dad? You'll have to send it from town. We don't have that service. Well, can't you phone it in? I can't hear you. Phone's busy at the moment. What? Say it again. But I can't wait. I'm in a hurry. I'm sorry, miss. Never mind. Can somebody take my bag? Yes, him. Where's your car? What? Well, I'm not driving. Oh, sure. That's too bad. If you'd left five minutes ago, you might have made it. If you're going to tell me there's not another train. I'm sorry, Dad. Oh, but... there's another one tomorrow morning. But tomorrow... I've got to get to New York right now. Just a moment. Pardon me, but would you mind lowering your voice? The phone. Thank you. What was that, Dad? Of all the inefficient hotels I ever had... Would you mind? This is long distance. Then why don't you phone from a booth? I would if there were a booth. But this happens to be the only phone that's costing me money. What'd you say, Dad? Can I hire a car somewhere? Not in this town, miss. Oh, but that's Will ridiculous. Will you please keep quiet? If you were a gentleman, you'd wait till I got through. I can't carry on this conversation. You have no right to monopolize the lobby. What, Dad? Yes? Of all the stupid things I ever heard of, this is the worst. Well, I'll tell you, Dad, I... Oh. Hello, Dad. Yeah, I'll drive down now. Yes, I'm leaving right away. See you soon. Bye. Little difficult trying to hear, eh, Dr. Sterling? Well, it calmed down a little when the storm blew over. Well, goodbye, Mr. Bird. See you next year. Be looking for you, Dr. Sterling. So long. Hello there. Oh, it's you. I'm uh, sorry I shouted at you. Oh, I didn't mind. But it's really bad for your nerve centers. You shouldn't get so excited. Well, I had a right to be annoyed. Um, is that your car there? Yes, it is. But it doesn't pay to get excited, miss. If you could see the punishment those little oh, cells take. Oh, I know. Take... Um, which way are you going? New York. New York. Oh, that's sweet of you. What is? I'll just toss my bag in the car. But listen. Well, that's all right. I'll be glad to do it. Now, wait. I don't want Here to... Here we go. My, aren't you kind, though? <laughs> I like your car. Of course, it's a little out of date, but old things are so interesting, aren't they? Oh, it's getting a little chilly. Wouldn't mind if I put on my coat. Just look out for those boxes back there. That's all. Look out! Look out! Good heavens! What's that thing? Why, it's a human head. It is not. It's a model. And if it's broken, let me see it. No. No cracks on that side. Spitting image of my Uncle Chester. No cracks on this side. I guess it's all right. Just be careful of it. Fond of him, aren't you? Do you always travel together? I use him, it, in my work. Well, I don't mean to pry into your private life, but uh, just what is Chester to you? I teach neuropsychiatry. I'm doing research on migraine headaches. The head opens up. Oh. And just what is a migraine headache? Blood vessels in the head dilate excessively, causing pressure on the nerve centers. We go at too fast a pace, especially women. They're not constituted to take an equal place in a man's world. What makes you think it's a man's world? The modern woman can match you men fiber for fiber and have a rib left over. <laughs> you must have read that someplace. I did. In a wonderful book called Spinster's Aunt Spinach. Oh, yes. Yeah, the chambermaid at the hotel had a copy. The one with no forehead. You shouldn't read trash like that. I didn't read it. Just as well. I wrote it. Oh. Well, sorry. Oh, that's all right. I didn't expect you or any other man to like it. Marriage is no longer the answer to a maiden's prayer. Standing over a hot stove is all right for the more backward of our sisters, but a new kind of woman is coming into her own. Oh, is that a fact? Yes. Mm -hmm. The kind that refuses to subordinate her own personality mm -hmm. to that of the egotistical, domineering male. <laughs> the Amazons tried it. <laughs> you know, you're the complete picture of the smug male. You won't discuss it because you know I'm right. You really can't discuss anything with women. They never have an open mind. Oh, you're the perfect type. I must remember you for my second book. Oh, look, would you mind stopping in this town? I have to send a wire to my publisher. I'm very anxious to get back. Oh, it'll give you a chance to rest your nerve centers. You've been going at a fast clip, you know. On the straight way back there, you almost hit 30. Okay. But will you please hurry? Thanks. This is awfully important. Oh, there's a telegraph office. You can park right here. Well, well. Right in front of the Justice of the Peace's office. And isn't there a wedding going on? What of it? It merely goes to prove that someone didn't read your book. 
You haven't heard of any lawyers in Reno starving, have you? Be right back. Make it snappy, will you? I'm due in New York at 7 o'clock. Hey, kid, you want to make a dime? Sure, what do I do, mister? Look, you see this sign? And what's it say? Oh, just married, huh? Mm-hmm. Hanging on that car over there, the bride and groom will be out any second, so don't let them see you. Well, I won't. Which car, you say? That one over there. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, mister. Will you take this telegram, please? Straight telegram to John S. Pierce, Pierce Publishing Company, New York. Driving down today. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a big surprise. Best regards, June Cameron. June Cameron? Are you... Are you the author? Yes. Uh, how much is the wire, please? Uh, uh, 62 cents. I read it three times. Did you? There you are, 62 cents. Oh, it's simply wonderful. I, I keep it under the counter. Will you autograph my copy for me? Well, certainly. Give it to me. Oh, thank you, Miss Cameron. Thank you so much. Not at all. You'll see that my wire is sent immediately? I sure will. Oh, Miss Cameron, you're probably in a hurry, but I do want to tell you what this book has done for me. It's, it's changed me into a career woman. <laughs> I used to feel awful when men didn't insult me, but now I don't even care. <laughs> Fine, you just give it up. Hey, are you ready? Let's go. Coming. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Cameron. Hey, Prudence, who's that? Why, that's June Cameron herself, the author of Spinster's Aunt Spinach. Spinster, huh? Why don't she practice what she preaches? She ain't no spinster. Why, she is so. Oh, yeah? Well, take a look at the sign on the car. If that don't say just married, I can't read. Just married? Oh, so that was the big surprise in the telegram. Well, wait till the newspapers get hold of this, and I'll tell them the deserter. <laughs> Will you please toss out my other bag? Here you are. Thank heavens I'm home at last. You're no happier about it than I am. You men resent the intelligent woman. All you want is someone to inflate your ego. The independent but frustrated female. Drop into my class someday. You're a good specimen. Thanks for the ride. <laughs> hey! My head! You've got my head! Come back here! Hey, come back! You're not going to get away with this! Where's my head? I don't know. I left it in the car. You did not. That head cost me $250, and I'm going to stay right here until you give it to me. Will you please get out of here? No, you've got my... Oh, oh there it is. It is not. That's my hat box. Give it to it me. It is not your hat box. My head's in there. Let go of it. Oh. oh, now look what you've done. You've broken the nose. I'm sorry. I thought it was my hat box, really, but you pulled the box out of my hands. That's right. The career woman is never to blame. Of all the ungrateful females... You force your way into my car. I drive you for 400 miles, pay for the gas and oil, and then you ruin a $250 head. You don't need that little piece. Chester won't get a headache in the nose. All right, I've had enough. If you're going to take that attitude, you can pay for the trip. It cost me $9.80. You owe me half, $4.90. Oh, run along and correct some papers or something. Ordinarily, I'm a very calm and peaceful individual. That's because I have thin earlobes and eyes set wide apart. But you see these? They're thumbs. Short thumbs. That means I'm stubborn. And I won't get out of here until I get my $4.90. Fortunately, my thumbs show no evidence of pygmy ancestors. But I, too, can have my obstinate moments, and this is one of them. What are you doing with that ashtray? Huh, it's mine now. I'll deduct 75 cents for it. That leaves four fifteen. you owe me. Oh, what's this? That's my paper knife, and you can put it right down. Well, it's not real silver, is it? No, sorry. The best I can do on this is a dollar. That is three fifteen you owe me. Now, what else? What's in this thing? That's the liquor cabinet. That's what I thought. Aha. Uh -huh. Scotch. Ten years old, too. That's more than I can say for you. This may take care of the balance. Now, let's be generous and say it's worth 40 cents a drink. Well, here's mud in your eye. <coughs> I'm wrong. 20 cents. <coughs> now, look, boys, look. I'm John Pierce. I'm Miss Cameron's publisher. If she's married, I'd know about it because it would probably be me. I. All right, but we want the story from her. 
Is this where the dame lives? Yes, sure, but now wait a minute, boys. June's only been back three hours, and it's late. Look, the paper said to get a story. We're reporters. Hey, look, we've here's got the car. Get... Just married, the sign says. Oh. An MP. She did all right. She married a doctor. Oh, that couldn't be her car. It isn't her car. It's her husband. Now, look, Mr. Pierce, we don't blame you for wanting to keep it quiet. We know that wedding bell means curtains for that next bestseller of hers. And we extend our condolences. But the other papers will have it in a couple of hours, and we've got to beat them to it. Yeah, we don't Come on, now, care. let's go up and get this over with. Now, believe me, boys, this is ridiculous. If, if June Cameron's married, I'm the, the King of Persia. Make way for His Majesty. Oh, Come on, fellas, let's get that, away. Yeah, that's good. Now, let's see. That makes a balance of 60 cents, you owe me. Would you like to take the rest out in aspirin? Don't interrupt. Marilyn never interrupts. Oh, I haven't told you about Marilyn, have I? Marilyn's the girl I'm going to marry as soon as I become a professor. Look, Hamlet, now that the bill's paid, will you get out? Very well, if that's the way you feel about it. Very well. Good day, madam. Hey, hey, not that way. That's my bedroom. Good day. Get out of there. Oh, by heavens, who is it? Congratulations. Where'd you meet him? Don't say a word. I'm going to change the back of the cops. What do you think of the matrimonial state? Well, fellas, yeah, please. Yeah, come on. We ought to get this. Don't Listen, tell me what this is all about, Johnny. Just let me guess. I know. It's a college initiation. Look, Miss Cameron, we're all losing sleep. Who, where, what, and why did you get married? All right, fellas. It's a very funny gag. Now, run along, tip over some milk wagons, and go home. You see? You see, she isn't married. She doesn't know a thing about it. Close that door. That's my bedroom. Now, come on, Miss Cameron. Your husband's in there. What's his name? He's not my husband. Johnny, throw these vultures out of here. They're going to print I'm married. Who is he, June? That man in there. He's not my husband. Now, listen okay, to... Okay, we'll print that the guy in the bedroom is not your husband. No, no. You can't do that. It would ruin our reputation. Look, June, we might as well admit it. The evidence is right in there. Well, I guess she's married, boys. Johnny, if you'll just listen. Thanks, Miss Cameron. We'll give you a nice, dignified ride. A photographer will be along later. Be seeing you. Come on, boys. Let's get out of here. We'll play the... Just what was the idea? Isn't he your husband? No. That migraine headache in there gave me a lift, followed me here, and ended up by passing out. You see, he's got short thumbs in. Hmm? Oh, never mind. Just get it through your head. I'm not married. All right, dear. I believe you. Fine time to decide that. Oh, but don't you see, darling, it was one thing or another. It's much better than newspapers believe you're married. But it's not the truth. It'll ruin me. Oh, when my creditors get through with me, I'll have to sublet my water cooler. Or will I? Wait a minute. How many spinsters are there in America? Exactly eight million and some thousands who aren't going to buy my book. And how many married women are there? Oh, there must be practically hundreds. I've got it. You're going to write that second book. A book about marriage. We'll call it, we'll call it, we'll call it Marriage Ain't Measles. Oh, Johnny. Johnny, dear, why don't you lie down for a minute? Whatever it is will go away. Listen, what you did for the spinsters, you can do for the housewife. Get the angle, you're converted. America's number one bachelor girl tastes the fruits of marriage and loves it. You mean to write a book you want me to pretend marriage to Dr. Jekyll in there? Oh, only till you finish the book and then Reno and you fake a divorce. You must be pretty deeply attached to me to cook up such an idyllic arrangement with that medical pot roast. Oh, it isn't that, dear. This is business and terrific. We can sell a million copies of Marriage Ain't Measles. Well, um, do you actually think if I wrote a book on marriage, it would sell? Oh, I knew you'd come through. Of course it would. Women would love someone to give them a reason for why they got married. Glorify the American home, security, the fireside. Show them how to keep romance alive. Right. Teach every wife to... Oh, but what about Junior in there? He'll never go through with it. I'll take care of him. I'll be back and talk to him first thing in the morning. Morning? Well, we can't take him out now. There might be reporters around. They'll think it's a gin marriage. Well, it's all settled then. Good night, darling. See you tomorrow. Hey, hey, where am I going to sleep? Well, uh, how about the couch there? That's what I thought. <laughs> Good morning, June. And how's America's favorite authoress? I feel like I've slept in a cement mixer. Where is he? Junior? How do I know? I guess he's still asleep. Come on, we'll go see. Well, there he is, and you can have him. Wake up. Wake up, old man. Huh? Huh? Hey, what are you doing in my room? Hmm, where am I? I can tell you one thing, Goldilocks. You're not in heaven. But you're a very lucky man. You've made money while you were asleep. That's it. Break it to him gently. Listen to what the morning paper has to say. Public spinster number one weds. June Cameron turns Benedict Arnold. Marries Dr. Timothy Sterling in Greenwich. Dr. Timothy Sterling, huh? Hey, that's me! It's a frame-up. Where are my pants? Well, don't look at me. I'm not wearing them. You get out of here. 
Well, run along, dear. I'll explain the whole thing. Do that. But you better be more convincing than I think you are. Well, uh, you see, Doctor, there's been a slight mix-up, and everyone thinks you're married to Miss Cameron. Where are my pants? And for the time being, it will be convenient for them to think so. You see, Miss Cameron's writing a book on marriage. And you want me to pose as her husband? Oh, no. Besides, Marilyn might... I'll make it worth your while, Doctor. Say, 5% of the gross sales, that'll be about... No, pay. it's all a cheap publicity stunt to sell that trash she writes. Are you going to give me my pants? Now, look, old man. I'll make it 10%. I said no, not for 110%. For the last time, where am I? Oh, oh, here they are. Now, let's not be hasty about this. Ten percent of the gross sales of that book will be a tidy little sum. Where's my head? Huh? I said, where's my head? How about the one with your hat on it? That's not it. The wax head, the one that opens up. Don't tell me that... Oh, oh, there it is. Now, if you'll just get out of my way, I'm going. Now, look, Doctor. Get out of my way and don't ever bother me again. If you do, I'll sue you for ten percent. Good day. Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of The Doctor Takes a Wife, starring Melvin Douglas and Virginia Bruce, in just a moment. But right now, I'm going to take a few seconds to, uh, well, to unravel a little yarn with our favorite fashion reporter, Libby Collins. Say, Libby, what is all this? Isn't knitting something new for you? I thought you just talked about fashions. Why, Mr. Roig, a woman doesn't stop talking when she starts knitting. As a matter of fact, I brought my knitting along because that's what I want to talk about. Knitting, you mean? Mm-hmm. Hand knits are smarter than ever now, especially the sort of thing I'm making, a black sweater. You know, a black sweater is one of the nicest Christmas gifts I can think of. There are lovely ones in the stores if you don't like to knit. They're so smart, and not just for sports and country wear by any means. They're just as right for tea or dinner or evening if you dress them up with a heavy gold or jewel necklace. And then they're so practical, so easy to lux. Black or bright, lux does them right. <laughs> yes, and the color needn't run a bit. Of course, a black sweater needs luxing just as often as a light one. Nobody wants that horrible feeling of, well, of not being quite sure about freshness. Frequent luxing makes you sure. Well, that's easy advice to follow, ladies. You'll have perfect results if you wash sweaters the new quick lux way. Here are some do's and don'ts to remember. Do make a paper pattern the size of your sweater before luxing. Then, after washing, ease the sweater back to this shape. Do use lukewarm Lux suds. Just squeeze them through, never rub. Don't use soaps that contain harmful alkali. Don't rub with cake soap. These things shrink wool, leave sweaters harsh and matted. So don't take chances with harsh soaps. Do stick to new quick Lux flakes for sweaters and all knitted things. Lux is so gentle, so fast, so thrifty. It keeps your pretty washables like new much longer. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act two of The Doctor Takes a Wife, starring Melvin Douglas as Tim and Virginia Bruce as June. <laughs> Timothy Sterling, professor of psychiatry, refuses to play husband to June Cameron, expert on feminine psychology. Standing on his constitutional right to remain single, he has left June's apartment in a huff. He's still in the same huff when he arrives at the medical building of State University. State University? Medical building? Just a moment, I'll connect you. Oh, hello, Dr. Sterling. Congratulations, Dr. Sterling. Get the editors of the Express, the Herald. Get all the papers. I want to talk to them. All right, Doctor. Hello, Dad. Tim, my boy, I've been trying to reach you. Look, Dad, let me explain. It was all a mistake. Son, you don't know how happy you've made me. For a while, I was very much afraid it was going to be Marilyn. Uh, huh? Huh? Were you? Yes. Definitely an inferior mate. Now, Dad, let me tell oh, you... Oh, I know how these things happen. Suddenly the right person comes along and the next thing you're married. Very wise. Dad, sit down. I, wa I, wa I, want, to I want you to sit down. I've got something to tell you. It may be a shock. I've got a little shock for you, my boy, but a rather pleasant one. I just spoke to Dean Lawton. Congratulations, Professor Sterling. That's beside the... Professor... But I thought Dr. Hampshire was going to get that post. It was close until this morning. But you know how the dean feels about marriage. And since you're a married man and Hampshire isn't... It couldn't be just because I'm married. It's always been a theory of the deans that the chair of neuropsychiatry should be held by a married man. A man who leads a natural, well-balanced life will have a sounder approach to the study of the unbalanced. Professor Sterling. 
Oh, that's too bad. Hey, what's the matter, son? Don't you want the professor's ship? Oh, yes, I do. I do. But you see, Marilyn's coming in on the boat in about an hour, and and the truth is... I... Congratulations, Professor yeah, Stelling. Congratulations. Yeah, my, yeah. my boy. Dean Lawton. Congratulations, Professor Sterling. When can we see the bride? Oh, any time. Well, that's fine, son. We'll all drop around tonight. Hello? Who? Oh, the Herald. No, 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 no. I didn't want to make a statement. Oh, well, well the reason I called was that uh, Mrs. Sterling and I would like to take a two-year subscription. I knew you'd come through, old man. I knew it. I know a gentleman when I see one. Thanks. Very sweet of you, Doctor. But what made you suddenly change your mind? This morning, the idea of posing as my husband seemed particularly revolting Well, to don't you. get the idea I like this. I'm only doing it because I'm... I'm a gentleman. I don't want to ruin your career. Thanks. But I hope you realize all the inconveniences. Now, now, the doctor knows what he's doing. And one thing I want to get straight. Of course, when you get to Reno, you'll have to take all the blame. My position at the university, you understand? Naturally, naturally. We'll paint her black as a coal scuttle. Yeah. I can see that chivalry is not dead. It's not doing so well, but it's not dead. Another thing, what about Marilyn? Marilyn? Who's Marilyn? The boat. I, I mean, my fiance. Her, her boat's due now. How am I ever going to explain this to her? Oh, just tell her that for the next three months she's got to believe in you, to trust you, to use blind faith. You can do it. You know how to handle women. Don't worry, old man. Don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> Marilyn! Marilyn! Here I am, dear. Over here. Hello, sweetheart. Hello, sweetheart. How touching. Well, darling, what's the matter? W were you seasick? Look at that. What? You know what? This paper. June Cameron weds M.D. Uh, now, wait, Marilyn. You'll have to trust me. You'll have to believe in me. That story I'd in the like paper... I'd like to stuff that story down your throat! Oh! Goodbye, Dr. Sterling. Marilyn, wait, listen! Gangway, gangway there! Hey, bud, what are you standing there for? You want to get run over and get killed? No. But don't put ideas in my head. Well, what happened? Oh, everything's fine. I can tell by his face. She wouldn't even give me a chance to explain. I opened my mouth to say something and got the newspaper pushed in it. Oh, that's too bad. A shame, a shame. Well, she'll probably cool off after a while. Well, I think it's darn sweet of you, in spite of all your trouble, to go through with this. Well, a gentleman's word is a gentleman's word. Now, if you'll tell me where I can put my stuff. Oh, there's room in there for some of your things. You can have the two top drawers in the bureau. Oh, darling, he'll need more than that. One drawer's enough for you. Oh, certainly. Just throw my things on the floor. How about my suits? I hang them right here in the closet. June, you take your things out. You'll find another place for them. There's always the ice box. It'll be good for the furs. Oh, one thing I forgot. That case over there is full of books. Where'll I put them? Do you think this is a good location for a branch library? Well, if you've no objection, I'd like to continue my profession. I'm preparing a fall course of study. Is this my bed? Oh, yes, yes, the couch. I slept there all last night. You know, I didn't even know I was sleeping. That's fine. Then you sleep there. I was wrong. Chivalry is dead. Now, darling, uh-uh, don't take that attitude. This is hard on all of you us. You take my dresser, my closets, and now my bed. Get out of my way. I'm going to finish this book in three weeks. There he'll stand, the man you love. Will you please stop that typing? What? I'm doing some important work, and it bothers me. And that muttering, too. Look, Pasteur, this is the way I work. You'll have to get used to it. You realize I'm doing you a favor just being here? Answer the door. Why don't we hire a butler, dear? Well, I'm delighted to My dear, I'm, I'm so happy. Oh, well, hello, Dad. I, I forgot to tell you, dear. A uh, few of the faculty wanted to drop in and meet you tonight. Congratulations, my dear. I've known Tim ever since he was a little boy. This is Dr. and Mrs. Nielsen, dear. Oh, Hello. Uh, here, Mrs. Sterling, is a little gift. It's not much, but Oh, it's... you shouldn't have done that, Dr. Nielsen. It's a book. Occupational Diseases of the Mind. <laughs> but just what we needed, you know. I was only saying today that... Dear, don't, don't you think we'd better make some sandwiches? The others will be here in a minute. Others? Isn't that wonderful? With all she's had to do, making fancy sandwiches. Uh, can I help? Oh, no, no, thank you. I've got some cookies. I'll whip up a little coffee. i just take long, Kim. I'd like to see the bride. Wait a minute, Awfully nice of you, Dr. Lionel, to help. Why, I've enjoyed it, my dear. What else can I do? Well, we're just about ready. Coffee's done. 
Now, here, you take these cookies and put a couple on each plate. I'll give three to the dean. He has a coconut fixation. <laughs> That's playing politics. Well, Tim's professorship's worth an extra cookie. You know, it's pretty funny. For years, Tim has been working 14 hours a day for that professorship. Finally, he gets it, but not because of his research. The thing that decides it's a simple little custom called marriage. Wait a minute. The dean gave Tim the professorship just because he was married to me? Of course. Oh, how unusual. You know, I think the dean deserves a couple of more cookies. Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue with our play, the makers of Lux Flakes switch you to New York for the latest news developments, direct from CBS. This is John Daly reporting from the CBS newsroom in New York, and here are the latest developments in the war with Japan. The first phase of the Japanese surprise attack against British and American possessions in the Pacific appears to be continuing full force. Late reports are sketchy, but they indicate that the offensive is still favoring the Japanese. CBS correspondent Tom Worthen reported from Manila a short time ago that there have been six raids on the Philippines since the war started, from Luzon in the north to Mindanao in the south. Manila itself has had three alarms, but Worthen said no bombs have actually dropped inside the city. Japanese forces are said to have landed on Lubang Island near the entrance to Manila Harbor. And Tokyo now claims the occupation of the American-owned islands, Guam and Wake. And the Japanese maintain that a blow of annihilation was dealt Hawaii's Pearl Harbor naval base in yesterday's initial attack. According to official Tokyo claims, an American warship has been sunk off Guam and several American merchant ships have been captured. Tokyo has not admitted a single naval loss. Meantime, Governor Poindexter of Hawaii reported a short time ago that Hawaii has been calm since the first blow. Official American accounts say that at least 1,500 persons were killed there by Japanese bomb attacks. The Japanese news agency Domei claimed just, <coughs> excuse me, claimed just a few minutes ago that almost 300 American planes have been destroyed in the two-day-old Pacific War. On America's part, that war became official a little over five hours ago when President Roosevelt signed the war resolution that had been passed in Congress with only one dissenting vote. Earlier in the day, Britain declared war, and Prime Minister Churchill pledged the full resources of the British Empire in the struggle with totalitarianism and aggression. Japan now faces not only the United States and Britain, but these other members of the non-Axis world. Nicaragua, Canada, Costa Rica, Haiti, Guatemala, San Salvador, the Dominican Republic, Australia, Honduras, the Free French Government, and the Greek and Belgian governments in exile. Mexico and Colombia have broken off diplomatic relations with Japan, and they are expected in the war tomorrow along with South Africa. China, which has been fighting Japan for four years, is reported preparing a declaration not only against Japan, but against Germany and Italy. On the West Coast, air raid preparations are well underway. It's just been reported that all San Francisco radio stations are now off the air under orders from federal authorities. CBS correspondent William Slocum phoned that news from San Francisco just a minute ago. And since we've been on the air, we have just received a late bulletin from San Francisco. The News Chronicle reports that 50 unidentified planes have been sighted flying from the southwest towards San Francisco. It also reported that all lights have been blacked out for 10 miles below the metropolis. That is a bulletin that has just been handed to me here in New York in the CBS newsroom. Now, a similar order closing all radio stations in Spokane, Washington, has been issued, and the Army has ordered the evacuation of all women, children, aged and infirm persons from regions around Fort MacArthur at San Pedro. In Washington tonight, the White House announced that President Roosevelt will speak to the country in a fireside chat at 10 o'clock tomorrow night, Eastern Standard Time. The White House also said that lease lend aid to Britain and Russia will not be interrupted by the outbreak of war in the Pacific. At the same time, Presidential Secretary Stephen Early issued a statement denouncing Germany. The Nazis, he said, have done everything possible to push Japan into the conflict. So far, neither Germany nor Italy has carried out the provisions of the tripartite Axis Pact and declared war against the United States. As you know, the pact said that if any member of the Axis Alliance becomes involved in war with a power that was at peace when the pact was signed in 1940, the other two members would go to the assistance of that member. The propaganda statements out of Berlin would seem to confirm the charge made by the White House tonight, though. At least the Nazis say Japan kept them informed throughout the preparations for attack in the Pacific. Earlier today, the Rome radio said that a state of war exists between the United States and the Axis powers, but that claim has not been officially confirmed so far in either Rome or Berlin. 
And with the United States united this evening in one single resolve to destroy Japanese militarism once and for all, American recruiting officers report that they have been swamped with men seeking to enlist. Thousands of men in every state of the Union have volunteered, even demanded, that they be allowed to serve. Before we leave you, we repeat again this bulletin which has just come in from San Francisco. Since we've been on the air, we've received this bulletin. The News Chronicle in San Francisco reports that 50 unidentified planes have been sighted flying from the southwest towards San Francisco. It's also reported that all lights have been blacked out for 10 miles below the metropolis and over an area 35 miles along the coast. And that's the latest news on the Pacific War. Columbia will interrupt its regularly scheduled programs to bring you the latest news. Our next scheduled news broadcast will be at 10 o'clock. And now we return you to the Lux Radio Theater in Hollywood. We continue with the second act of The Doctor Takes a Wife. June is now aware that Tim pretended to be married only because his professorship was at stake. Tim has explained the situation to his fiancée, Marilyn, and secured a complete pardon. For a while, things have been looking very rosy, but now Tim is again at the boiling point. All right, now this time you've gone too far. Who had this picture printed in the paper? Johnny, you promised me you wouldn't. Oh, don't blame me. Charlie must have done it. Look at that. I've never had my arms around her in my life. I know, old man. It's what they call a composite photograph. They do it by... I don't care how they do it. You realize it took me three solid hours to explain this to Marilyn? Marilyn, Marilyn. Would you mind not mentioning her name more than every other breath? I'll mention the name of my fiancé as often as I please. You resent any woman who's feminine. You resent any woman who doesn't smoke long black cigars and isn't general manager of a couple of railroads. Now, now, wait a minute, kids. Furthermore, you've no right to say those things. You've never even met Marilyn. Well, she's going to marry you. That gives me a rough idea. Now, look, I've got an idea. If I can only... count on one thing. At least she won't wisecrack through our honeymoon. Just to make sure, better not wear those green pajamas you've got hanging in the closet. What? Hello there. Now, don't tell me you two are having another quarrel. Well, she... Mr. Pierce, are you here again... Yes, sir. Mr. Pierce, did you ever study chemistry? No, no, sir. Well, if you had, you'd know that sometimes two elements can be placed together successfully. But when a third element, known as a catalytic agent, is added, there is frequently an explosion. Oh, Pop, you can rule him out. He's only an innocent bystander. Well, no matter. Tim, I just dropped by to give you a little advice. When you talk to Burkhart this afternoon, make it clear that you don't want him to use any of your research in his new book. Well, thanks, Dad. I appreciate the advice, but after all, Burkhart's... Are... June, you'll be along. See that Tim doesn't get too generous. Oh, well, I don't think I'm going with him. Oh, yes, dear. I forgot to tell you, the Burkharts invited us for the weekend. Why, you... We'll be leaving in a few minutes. You'd better start packing, dear. It'll be an interesting weekend. Oh, yes, I'm sure. Yes, they have a 15-year-old daughter. She's just written a novel, and she's dying to read it to you. Well, I won't hold you up. It's a good seven hours' drive. Goodbye. Bye, Dad. I'm sorry. I forgot to mention it. That's all right. I'm not going. Oh, you've got to go. That father of his will think you're staying behind because of me. But I was going to finish the book over the weekend. Well, you can work up there, darling. It's probably an idyllic setting. The forest primeval, the winding streams. And a babbling 15-year-old reading me an enchanting little epic called Sink or Swim or Sarah Goes Out for Basketball. Oh, no, gentlemen, I'm not going. <laughs> just to keep the record straight. I'm doing this for Pop and not for you. Okay, okay. I think it's just about the most inconsiderate. Is that a cop after me? Why, he is. What have I done? Whatever it is, it can't be for speeding unless the limit is 12 miles an hour. Officer, you're making a mistake. I was only... Okay, no ticket. I spotted the MD license on the car. You a doctor? Yes. Well, come on. There's an emergency case. Follow me. How soon will it be, doctor? The baby won't be along for a while yet. Yeah, it's mighty kind of you to put yourself out this way, but I'm sure glad you're here. The missus has been having a lot more trouble than usual. Oh, most of the time it just seems that way. I think she'll get along all right. Can you get me some hot water, Mr. Martin? Well, I'm kind of laid up, Doc. My foot, uh, Billy here, has been doing some of the work. Dad's had his foot banged up for almost a week now. He has? Well, let me see it. What's wrong with it? Sort of twisted it. Hmm, sort of twisted. Yes, maybe you sort of broke it. I'll take a look at that while I'm here. Where's your nearest neighbor? Mrs. Sawyer, about a mile down the road. We'll have to get her. Is it anything serious? Oh, just a baby and a broken ankle. Say, there's a Mrs. Sawyer down the road. Billy here will show you where she lives. Would you mind driving down and getting her? I may need some help. 
I'd better run upstairs now. Make it snappy, will you? Hey, didn't you hear the doc? What does Pasteur think is wrong with me? Promise? I said, what's wrong with me? I can help. Come on, Billy, show me where the stove is. Run up and tell the doctor the water's boiling, will you? Okay. Mr. Martin, what does the doctor want to use for rags? Hey, can't you use those over there, miss? Well, I think you'll want clean ones. This'll do. Hey, you're not going to tear up that dress. Well, that's all right. An extra one I brought along. Everything all right down here? Uh, where's Mrs. Sawyer? Couldn't she come? I don't know. I didn't ask her. Oh. Say, that's a pretty nice sterilizer there for a homemade job. Rig it up yourself? Mm-hmm. That's your new dress you're tearing up. It made me look too feminine. Uh, how's the missus, doctor? Almost any time now. Doc! Hey, Doc! My sister to come right away! All right, son, all right. You better get some more water at the pump. I'll be needing it. Okay, you can stop pumping now. You're about ready to drop, aren't you? Is the baby here? Yep, safe and sound. Another president? No, I'm afraid it's another career woman. I never heard such kicking and screaming. Oh. Hey, Doc, it's Nidian. <laughs> it's all red. <laughs> <laughs> well, stop worrying, son. It's all right. Well, I guess it's too late to go to the Burkharts. Oh, that's too bad. You miss your talk with him. Yes, and you'll miss hearing Sarah goes out for basketball. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel? You must be pretty exhausted. Oh, I was just a little scared. The fr that's the first baby since I was an intern. Well, with that broken field running you did between the baby and the ankle, you looked awfully good from where I sat. Thank you. So did you. Thank you. You know, sometimes it's nice to have a career woman around the house. Really? Well, I mean for emergencies. Oh. Well, if you're finished here, let's go. What's the big rush? The emergency's over, isn't it? And I've got a book to finish. So I can leave for Reno. Yeah, that's right. Let's go. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille and Melvin Douglas and Virginia Bruce will bring us Act Three of The Doctor Takes a Wife. Meantime, let's listen in, first in a busy office. Her application can go on file. She's not the type of girl for this office. Now, let's look in at a holiday dance. I wish the boys would ask Ruth to dance. She's feeling left out. And last, in a home around the corner. Hello? Oh, hello, Mary. Who did you say? Oh, my dear, don't let's have her on the committee. We all know people like these who aren't as popular or successful as they might be. And you know, it seems too bad when just a word or two could straighten things out. Well, that sort of word or two is awfully hard to say, though. No one likes to criticize another person for lack of daintiness. But the trouble is... We ourselves can't tell when we offend. That's why it's so important to take particular care with the things we wear. Underthings especially should be luxed every day. Dresses, blouses, and sweaters often. It's easy to do this, too, because new quick lux is so fast. Takes away every trace of perspiration so quickly. Then you're sure of freshness. Sure, too, of keeping dainty things new looking longer. Lux is gentle. Safe for everything safe in water. With girls who have a daily Lux habit, here's what happens in offices. I'll keep her application here on my desk. She's just the type we want. And at holiday dances. Say, look at the rush Ruth's getting. My, she's popular. And in homes. Hello? Oh, hello, Mary. Who'd you say? Mmm, why, of course we want her on the committee. Yes, words like that are pleasant to hear. And Lux girls hear them all the time. Remember, without daintiness, no other charm counts. So don't take chances. Use new quick Lux each day. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille, 
curtain rises on the third act of The Doctor Takes a Wife. June's new book has been finished and published and overnight heads the bestseller list. There's no longer any reason to keep up the pretense of a marriage. So Tim and June have packed their belongings and are ready to move out of the apartment. Well, I guess that's everything. I'll send someone around to pick up these books. I take them now, but we're driving up to Marilyn's uncle's for the weekend. That's all right. I'm sorry Marilyn insisted on you leaving for Reno tonight. No, I don't blame her. I'd have done the same thing. I think she's been pretty decent about the whole thing. And that goes for you, Doc. Without a husband, the book never would have been written. <laughs> Without a wife, I'd never been made a professor. Well, we, we've spoken our little pieces, so goodbye. <laughs> Take good care of Chester. Goodbye. I hope you and John Pierce will be very happy. Thanks. And that goes for you and Marilyn. Thanks. Goodbye. Oh, I forgot to tell you. When we first started this thing, I said I wanted you to take the blame for the divorce. I really didn't mean that. I'd rather you blame it on me. I will not. A bargain's a bargain. But it wouldn't look good for you. The other way's simpler. No, I won't do it. Wait a minute. Look at these thumbs. They're very short. I'll just say it was cruelty or something. Tell them I corrected papers in bed. Goodbye, Joan. Goodbye, Tim. Well, hello there, old man. Hello. Microscope's all packed? Mm-hmm. Well, our little marital conspiracy turned out beautifully for all of us. Nobody the wiser. Yeah. You know, Pierce, you're a pretty lucky fellow. Yes, the book's selling like the proverbial hotcakes. I wasn't talking about the book. Hmm? Oh, yes, June's a wonderful woman. Well, bye, Professor. So long. Hello. Does Frieda Schultz live here? You've got the wrong... Oh... Hello, Johnny. Here are the railroad tickets, honey. I thought it would be best to use another name. How do you like it? Do I look like Frieda Schultz to you? Let's see. Oh, a little. <laughs> Don't you see if they find June Cameron in Reno, it'll kill the book. This way we can sell it right up to the day you announce the divorce. You've figured out everything, haven't you, Johnny? Darling, I'm a very happy man. I just added it all up. In six weeks, we can sell 80,000 copies. Wow. What's the matter? Nothing. Oh, there must be something. I said nothing's the matter. I'll take it. Good morning. I'm from the Morning Express. I'd like to see Miss Cameron. Oh, no interviews today, old man. If you'll phone... I, I... think she'll see me. Hi, Miss Cameron. What do you want? Didn't you say, Miss Cameron, that you were married in Greenwich? Why, yes. Strange. I've just been talking to the license bureau up there, and they've got no record of it. Well, you see, it wasn't in Greenwich proper. It was a little outside. Yeah, it was a little place by the fork in the road. Look, let's stop kidding around. I followed a hunch and checked up. I happen to know you were never married. How dare you make such a statement? If I'm wrong, show me the certificate. Well, well, you see, it's in... It's in my safety deposit box. Look, you needed that kind of publicity for the book. I hate to be the guy to kill the golden goose, but my job is to get news, and this is a great story. But you can't print it. It's not true. All right, I'll give you a break. We don't go to press until midnight. You can show me you're married before then, I'll kill the story. That's a real break for you. You can't print that. Think what it'll do to the book. Think what it'll do to Tim. They'll throw him out of his job. Who cares? I care this comes out, he won't be able to get a job as a horse doctor. After he's been so decent with us, you take that selfish... Well, I didn't mean it that way. It's just that the copies are already printed. Your affection for me is touching. The fact that the tabloids will make me look like a combination of Madame Dubarry and Cleopatra doesn't make the slightest difference to you. Oh, that's not it, June. The profits... Profits. Are the... They're important, huh? not people. Here's the future of a really great man at stake, and you're worrying about carnations for your buttonhole. Are you in love with this bumpkin? Yes, I am in love with him. What do you think of that? All right, everybody, come and get it. Come on, Cookie, dinner. Marilyn, I wish you wouldn't call me Cookie. It sounds silly. Silly? But you've always been my Cookie. I know, but in front of other people. All right, old Grouchy. Now, come on, and after dinner, you're going to stand next to me when I make my big speech. Speech? What speech? I'm going to announce our engagement. You can't do that. We're not divorced yet. Well, I'll tell them you're going to be. But if that gets out, it'll ruin her book. I don't care. I've risked our happiness long enough because of her book. Pardon, Miss Thomas. There's someone at the door who wants to see you. Now, Cookie, you think that over. It's you. What do you want here? I've got to see Tim. If you're Where coming here trying to make trouble... This is important. Where is Please he? go away. You'll spoil everything. This is our engagement party. Engagement? But you promised to wait till I... I think we've done more than enough for you. 
But this is important to Tim's career. I feel that I'm equally important to it. Get out. Ah, Southern hospitality. <laughs> Come on, Marilyn, what's yeah, it all about? Yeah, big surprise, Marilyn. All right, everybody, I'll tell you right now. Come on, Tim. Wait, wait, Marilyn, you can't do this. Quiet, everybody, quiet. Now for the big surprise. I want you so all... Isn't that Tim's Look, wife? here comes June Cameron. What's she doing here? Marilyn, my dear. Hello, Tim, darling. I'm so sorry to be late, Marilyn. But you... you go you right ahead to... with what you were doing. I'll just sit in a corner and go on with my knitting. Well, dear, I, I'd like you to meet all the folks. Oh, no, don't bother. We'll all get to know each other. I have an announcement to make. Quiet, everyone. Why, Mrs. Sterling, is that for you? Yes. Why, it, it looks like a baby's booty. Yes. You didn't mind if I brought my knitting along, did you? You, you know how these things are. Is it, is it for you and Tim? Of course. Who else? Mrs. Sterling's going to have a baby. No, she's oh, getting her a new baby. 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 Oh, you can't do this to me. I know you're not married. Oh, how can you? Oh, she's fainted. Oh, Let her face. Oh, this whole thing's a frame-up. Marilyn, I don't know anything about this, I swear. I'll give you five minutes to get out of here. Dora. Yes, Miss Thomas? You'll find Dr. Sterling's bags in the room near the stairs. He's leaving now. Tomorrow, have the room fumigated. And so the reporter just followed his hunch and found out we really weren't married. That's why I came to the party. Uh-huh. Well, what are you going to do about it? Sure, what is there to do? Congratulations for the cutest trick of the week. Oh, believe me, I didn't plan it. But when she told me she was going to announce your engagement, the cat in me crept out. Uh-huh. Where can I drop you? Let me off at the first hotel. I don't know where it'd be around here. You can ask in that gas station. That's what I intended doing. All right, I just suggested it. Nice night. Fill her up? No, thanks. Where's the... Nearest hotel. You're looking at it. Sam Appleby's spotless auto court. Nice, clean, soft beds. Dollar fifty and up. All right. Will you take my bag? Yes, ma'am. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. This way, ma'am. Cabin's right down here. Thanks. Certainly is a fine night, isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? Well, this is your cabin. Go right in. You can put my bag down there. Anywhere. All righty. Now, if there's anything you want, just give me a call. I'll be up at the gas station. Thanks. Good night. <laughs> hey! Who is it? Me, Pastor. Open the window. Oh, go away. June, I want to talk to you. Go away. Don't be silly. Let me in. No. Hey, look. You see those short thumbs? That means I'm stubborn. Let me in. Oh, now listen, Tim. You listen. Ah. June, I... I promised the people in the apartment next door that we'd play bridge with them next Thursday. Can you make it? Oh, oh Tim, I, I oh, think so. June. Oh, Tim, but I'm a career woman. I'm no good except... That's right, but you see, this is an emergency. We'd like to send a wire, please, to the Morning Express. The message, please? At home, Bungalow 5, Sam Appleby's spotless auto court. Marriage certificate number Y87642. Best regards. And sign it, Dr. and Mrs. Timothy Sterling. Mr. DeMille and our stars return to the microphone in just a moment. Now, here's the kind of thing that women say when they change from ordinary wash day soaps to new Quick Lux for their dishes. Say, this new Quick Lux is wonderful. I just can't believe I need so little to get a whole big dish pan full of suds. It's true, though. Thrifty new Quick Lux gives you more suds, ounce for ounce, even in hard water than any of ten other popular soaps by actual laboratory tests. From two to four times as much suds as some of those soaps, and more than any of them. 
But that's not all. You're due for a lot of pleasant surprises. For not only do you get more suds with Lux, but you get them so fast. Why, they start piling up the second you turn on the water. And here's the pleasantest thing of all. Those rich, quick suds are so kind to your hands. That has been proved in the famous one-hand tests. You see, there's no harmful alkali in gentle new quick Lux to roughen or redden your skin. No harsh red dishpan hands for you. Not when you stick to Lux flakes for your dishes. You try Lux and see. Start right in tomorrow and prove these things for yourself. There's a big box of new quick Lux waiting for you at your grocer's. It comes in the same familiar package and doesn't cost you a penny more. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. The doctor took a wife, but we've persuaded him to bring her back. So Melvin Douglas and Virginia Bruce join us again at this microphone. Thank you, C.B. Well, Virginia, I guess we've done it again. Certainly looks like it, Mel. Now we'll have to go after Bill Powell and Myrna Lloyd's reckon. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't want to seem over-curious, but what's this all about? Well, Virginia and I just got married again. In the play, I mean. <laughs> and it's happened three or four times before on the screen. So, in 1945, if our luck holds, we hope to pass Bill and Myrna. <laughs> That's pretty ambitious, Mel. They've held the championship for years. We just want to know whose side you're on, Mr. DeMille. Mm-hmm. If you aren't for us, you're against us. <laughs> well, if you, if you really want to know where I stand, I'm directly behind the eight ball. <laughs> well, in the meantime, why don't you tell us about next week's play? Thank you for helping me out, Virginia. Next week's play was a great success as a Warner Brothers picture. And before that, as a novel, it led the bestseller list for months. It's All This and Heaven Too. And our stars will be two of America's most distinguished dramatic players, Betty Davis and Charles Boyer. <laughs> yes, yes. That's the way we feel about it, too. In All This and Heaven Too, we have a play made to order for these fine artists. Betty Davis and Charles Boyer starred in this drama on the screen. So those who saw the picture know that they'll hear two acting performances of rare power next Monday night. Congratulations, C.B. That's a real dramatic scoop. We'll all be listening. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> we pronounce you both terrific. And now, a brief but serious word. It is war. War to the end. Japan has asked for it. And America is answering in the strongest language the world has ever heard. Every city must back the men in the armed forces. Back them with work and with money. Buy United States defense bonds and stamps. Get them at your post office or savings and loan association. Get defense stamps at your retail store or from your newspaper carrier boy. Buy them, buy them as often as you can and guarantee the destruction of the Japanese Empire. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Betty Davis and Charles Boyer in All This and Heaven Too. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from... Hollywood. <laughs> Melvin Douglas appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor and is currently seen in their production of Two Faced Woman. Heard in tonight's play were Ferdinand Munier as Tim's father and Charles Seal, Verna Felton, Dix Davis, Tori Carlton, Jean O'Donnell, Fred Mackay. Edward Marr, Suzanne Curran, Griff Barnett, Frank Penny, and Boyd Davis. Tune in next Monday night to hear Betty Davis and Charles Boyer in All This and Heaven Too. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>